All right, welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. I'd like to welcome everybody to our college tonight. And uh, I'd like to first cover the format of the college. First, we'll have our a brief announcements period and our speaker will speak and we usually give them up to an hour, but we'll see what happens with our presentation. Afterwards, we have a question and answer period where we have questions and the, and the speaker gets at it. That's, you know, and then after that, we have our infamous rebuttal period where you can then speak on or off su subject on what we're doing. And after that, uh, we then, uh, I'll keep the meeting generally ends about nine o'clock, but I'll keep the Zoom call open if we are engaged in, the, in an engaged discussion tonight. The college has basically two rules. One is one fool at a time. And two is uh, no personal attacks. That means I can't call Charlie a schmuck. Hey. <laughs> All right, Charlie, uh, let me get the schedule up and let's get these announcements going. And if anybody else has uh, any announcements that are applicable to the college at this time, uh, let us uh, let him speak now after Charlie. So Charlie, go ahead and I'll uh, pull the schedule up when you're ready. Okay. Uh, welcome to meeting number... 3,627 of the College of Complexes, the playground for people who think. Okay, first of all, we have a e relatively new email Google group. Am I still on? Yeah, yeah. you're still on, Charlie. Oh, you're bringing up the screen, I see. Yes, I see. Okay, we have an email Google group, uh, which instructions right there at the top. Uh, also, down below that, there is a, a link for a meetup group. You get one or two notices per week of the upcoming program and a little description. So I'd recommend signing up for either one of those. Okay, although I am not a capitalist, I will give an advertisement for our upcoming programs. On August the 7th, the Young World Federalist will be talking about a movement to give humanity a voice in global affairs. And there's a video there, a short video, a 10 minute video explaining that if you want further information. Anyhow, for many years, I was a member of the World Federalist Association, looking to support United Nations and NGO activities. On August the 14th, Charles Paydock will be speaking on the topic of a look at the life of an ordinary person since the beginning of time and how it has changed. This, I've been working on this. Uh, we're going to keep it to about half an hour presentation uh, with many, many uh, bits of information on the life lifestyle of the ordinary person, the little guy, over time. And uh, next, all August the 21st and the 28th are presently open. We're having a little difficulty filling these dates. Oh. So if you'd like to speak, I know of someone or an organization we should invite, please let me know and we'll extend an invitation to them. Again, two dates are open. Uh, this is a good time if you've never spoken to the college before. Okay, Trav, turning over into September. We have our regular annual special Labor Day speaker, Mark Burroughs, who spoke on uh, uh, um, railroads before uh, you'd be talking about the organized labor movement and our accomplishments and challenges he spoke before on Eugene Debs uh, which he knows quite a bit about but he's going to this is our annual Labor Day program on unions and the conditions of working people in the United States. On September the 11th, uh, Tim Fetzer will be returning 
to discuss this is on September 11. And he's going to talk about 9-11, reality or illusion. Jim was the founder of the Academics for Truth. Uh, and uh, is well-known spokesperson on this issue. So that should be a well-attended meeting. <laughs> on September the 18th, Green America. I don't know if you're familiar with their magazine. Very informative on ecological issues. But Green America will be sending a representative to telling us about how to uh, have a low carbon, light, low, low consumption lifestyle. Yes. On September the 21st, uh, the author, uh, Mike Seen, uh, will be returning. He's got a new book in, in preparation. He traveled around the United States at the height of the pandemic, interviewing various individuals. So it might be interesting to ascertain what he encountered in different parts of the United States. Anyhow, that's it. Hope to see you at the College of Complexes. Take it away, Tim. All right. Uh... Andrew, I'm going to just let you go right ahead and get right into your presentation. Take as much time as you need because we go up to about an hour or so. But uh, and if you need to get into a little bit of the weeds, we'll, I'm sure we'll be ready to dig down into the weeds of your organization before long. And uh, hopefully we'll uh, get going. So share your screen and uh, let's share it for Andrew. Okay, thank you. Yeah, before I even share my screen, I'll tell a, a quick story of just how I got about me getting involved with ranked choice voting. Because back in early 2020, I was at an event um, and I had my ranked choice voting sign and a clipboard and a woman came up to me and she's like, oh, I love ranked choice voting. Where do I sign up? And I said, oh, here you go. And she gave her the clipboard. And as she was signing up, I asked, I said, well, you know, why do you support ranked choice voting? And, um, you know, her, her story was, you know, I'm one of the lucky ones. I, I grew up, you know, had a decent and whatever life. My family's very close, big family. Um, but last Thanksgiving, rather than all getting together like normal, um, only about half of us did. And so my siblings didn't show up. My aunt didn't come. And it was all <laughs> divided based on political ideology. Um, the Republican, Democratic divide um, impacted their family. They, they didn't even get together for Thanksgiving. And I just told that story because, you know, I want to start this presentation really with, um, with the why. You know, why, why ranked choice voting? Why am I working on this? And, and we could go from there. And that story illustrates some of it. And so I'll, I'll actually start with a little, a quick poll, you know, just if, if for people on video, show of hands, if you think the country is too polarized. Some hands, yeah. <laughs> and and would you say politics in general are, are broken? Maybe, yeah. So, you know, there, there's lots of polling on this. So this was, um, this one's from 2010, but you know, it's always between 75 and 90% of, of people say government is broken when you, when you poll. And uh, public trust in government is near historic lows. And I should update this for, for you know, the more recent years. Um, I think I want to make sure I'm not missing anything. Um, yeah, you know, we're, we're still historically low, close to Civil War time low in terms of public trust. And if, if polling isn't your thing, we could look at, um, at actual voting data. So in 92, this is a map of how each county in, in the United States voted. Um, if it's red, it means that the Republicans won that county by 20 percentage points or more. The blues are where Democrats won by 20 percentage points or more. And you know, there's a few sporadic, whatever. Um, but in 2016, it looked like this. Right? And so clearly, I mean, it's something that we all kind of feel. It's the one thing we all seem to agree on or that something's really broken, that we're very polarized, that government isn't necessarily working for the average voter. Clearly we're divided. And normally when, when 
I bring this up, what people tend to do is they start to say, well, who's to blame? And we point at politicians and, you know, there's very familiar faces of who might be to blame, you know, but if, if you're not blaming the first person or the next one or the, you know, Chicago in or some other people in Chicago and Illinois, there's always another villain that you could choose a next person up. And really we think this is the wrong question, right? There's something systemic here that's going on. And, you know, as, as you know, I'm, I'm talking about ranked choice voting. So what happens with the way we vote today? You know, what, what, what sort of the dynamics? And, and you could look at it as really, we only have two viable options in most elections, you're a Democrat and a Republican. So if you're a libertarian guy, and I think we have some on the call, you're, you're probably heard before, no, 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 don't vote for the libertarian. You're gonna be wasting your vote. You're gonna take your vote away from the Republican and you're gonna ha ha hand those you know, evil Democrats the election. Or if you're on the other side and maybe you're, you're a Green Party person, you're told the same thing, like, no, 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 don't vote for the Green Party. You're gonna take votes away from the Democrat and you're gonna just give the election to the Republicans, okay? And, and this is driven by the way we vote. So we use what's called plurality voting and there's no need to get a majority. You don't need to get 50%. You just need to get more votes than anyone else running. And so what this does is from the candidate's perspective, we, we often ask questions like, you know, does my candidate have a shot at winning? Will I be wasting my vote, right? And so, so we're, we often have to make a, a, a little bit of a strategic call based on what polling says and whatnot to say, can I vote for who I want? And oftentimes you might want one of the top two candidates, that's fine too, but we, we all know that these questions cross everyone's mind. And then from the uh, uh, candidate's perspective, not the vote, that was the voter's perspective, from the candidate's perspective, they often ask things like, what's the least number of votes I need to win? And, and in a sense, maybe they don't say this directly, but who's the villain? Like, how, who am I really going up against? Who's my main competition? Because if, if I could get voters to not want to vote for them, it really increases my chances. And so, you know, you could, you could, you know, cue the ominous music as we say, but rather, rather than discussing the issues, we, there's a tendency for candidates to really attack their opponents. They paint them as, you know, evil or, or unqualified or even perhaps dangerous. Okay, and, and you know, really this is not the way to run a democracy. And we can do better, we must. And, and ranked choice voting is what I'm talking about today. And it's for, it's a way that we really believe is just an obvious way of doing better. So ranked choice voting is already catching on across the US. It is used statewide in Maine. They used it in 2020 for the presidential election. It passed for statewide use in Alaska. And, and those are two interesting states because Maine is a little bit left-leaning, uh, Alaska a little bit right-leaning. Um, they both adopted ranked choice voting. It was used in 2020 in the presidential primaries in five states, Alaska, one of them, then Hawaii, Nevada, Wyoming, and Kansas. It's used in many of the Southern states for overseas and military voting. Um, it's used right here in, in Springfield, Illinois in a very limited fashion. So just for local elections in Illinois for overseas and military. And, and I'll get into a little bit of why that is, but it's, it's really, it's, in that case, it's really to allow early voting to happen without worrying about your candidate dropping out. And then other cities that have adopted it are all over the place now. And there are some really big cities in here. New York City just had the, the race for mayor where they used ranked choice voting, San Francisco, Oakland, um, Austin, Texas passed it. Minneapolis has been using it for a long time. Um, Utah is, is trying it out in 20 some odd cities in their state. So it's really taking off across the, the US. There's a big push for it. And there's a, a good reason why. We, we think it just makes a ton of sense. So I'll go through how it actually works, right? So, so today when you vote, we go to the election box and we pick a single candidate that we want. You know, that, we, that we're voting for. With ranked choice voting, you rank your candidates. You, you rank your first choice, second choice, third choice, down the list, as many or as few candidates as you like. Um, so in this case, this is my ballot. My number one choice is Sylvester Kath. 
Um, I take Bugs Bunny number two, Wile E. Coyote's my third, Daffy Duck fourth, and Roadrunner, I, you know, I find Roadrunner to be a complete jerk. Uh, I, I'm not even gonna check his name. I, I don't want anything to do with Roadrunner. So when we actually count the votes, what we would do is just look at everyone's first choice and that's it. And if someone has 50% or more, the election's over, right? But ranked choice voting is going to make sure that whoever wins has a majority, 50% or more. And so in this case, nobody has, has a majority, no one has more than 50%. So what we do is we have an instant runoff. The last place candidate is eliminated. And if you voted for that candidate as your first choice, your vote goes to your second choice instead. And so in this case, while Wiley while Coyote is, is in last, so he's eliminated, and anyone who voted for them first, it goes to their second choice, right? And then we, we recount the votes. And if someone has 50%, it's over. And if not, we repeat this process. So in this case, no one has 50%. Sylvester Cat, you know, is my top choice is eliminated. So my vote's gonna go to Bugs Bunny. Anyone else who voted for Sylvester goes to their, their next choice. And we count the votes. And in this case, we still don't have a winner. So we eliminate Roadrunner. And now we have a winner and that's Bugs Bunny in this case. And so, so what this allows us to do is there's no more vote splitting. You get to vote for whatever candidates in whatever order, no strategic voting. Um, and you're not necessarily voting against someone you don't like. You get to say, this is my top choice, my second choice, third choice, um, more nuance in the election. There could be more than two viable candidates suddenly so we're not, we're not necessarily divided left, right. It's, it's more, um, we could have more nuanced discussion and that's for both generals and primaries. And then there's, there's an incentive with this for candidates to not trash their opponents, not, not, not do personal attacks. Because if I wanna, even if I'm not your first choice, I wanna be your second choice or third choice. And if, I, if I'm insulting your top choice, um, you know, you, you might not like me so much. And, um, not want to rank me as your next choice. And so there's an incentive instead to talk more about issues than, than, um, than negative campaigning against your opponents. And this is what we're seeing. So in Minnesota where they used it, um, overwhelmingly people are saying, yeah, the campaign's just a lot more civil. And this is happening all over the place where ranked choice voting is being used. In fact, in many cities that, that adopt a ranked choice voting, co-campaigning becomes a thing. So you have two candidates, air ads together that say, vote for me first and, if, if, and vote for her second. And if, if you don't wanna do that, vote for her first and me second, mm -hmm. right? Cause we're very similar. We'd both be exceptional candidates um, and, and we, we want your vote. And so, so there's this tendency to, which is almost unheard of today, but there's, um, this could actually happen. There could be this, look, we know we're not that far off. We don't need to attack each other. We could, we could say, hey, she would, she'd be a terrific candidate. I still think you from, vote for me first, but, um, but she'd be great too. Uh, and, and this is why, and these are where our differences are, but on the big things, we're very similar. There tends to be an increase in voter turnout. I don't wanna dwell on this point too much because there's so many factors that impact voter turnout that um, it's hard to say how much ranked choice voting is responsible. But when you look at sort of aggregate, um, we're, we're seeing higher uh, turnouts where ranked choice voting is being used. But the second point, the no new voter errors is a big one. So when people rank their choices in ranked choice voting elections, the, the rates of mismarked ballots are no higher than they are today. So people are finding it very easy to use. And, and there's no thrown away ballots because people fill them out incorrectly or, or something like that. There's also very high reporting, 95% reporting um, out of New York, for, an, for instance, where voters say ranked choice voting was easy to use. Um, another advantage is that it helps to increase diversity. And, or really what it does is it helps to select the most preferred candidate. And so again, when you look, when you take a step back from all the elections and, and you look at everywhere that's using ranked choice voting, what you find is that the most preferred candidates are popping up in all these little areas and you get more of a um, people voted into office that better represent the voters. And so um, 
we're seeing that or there's sort of a, uh, a way of, of measuring that by how many women are getting elected, how much, how more diverse to, to the electorate again. There's the possibility of saving money. So in Chicago, for instance, we have a mayor race and then we have a runoff between the top two. So the last mayor race, Lori Lightfoot had 17% of the vote. Frank Wiggle had 16%. They were the top two and they went into a runoff. With ranked choice voting, we could eliminate that runoff if we wanted to, and we could have one election determine the winner. Um, it would save the city of Chicago uh, millions of dollars, 3.5, 3.6 million um, every election cycle. And so, so another perk of, of ranked choice voting, um, if, we, if we do decide to eliminate an election um, due to its use. Oops. And so largely with, with what we're saying is, you know, there's, there's really a lot of benefits. There's, there's very little um, downside and we, and we could have discussions about what those might be, but um, it seems like a real no brainer solution. And, and we're really pushing for this in all levels in Illinois. Um, here's the progress we've made, some progress we made so far. Uh, there are bills in the Illinois State House in the Illinois uh, Senate. Um, the Senate Bill 1785 has eight co-sponsors. Um, it would bring rank choice voting to state elections. So that's governor, lieutenant governor, um, you know, secretary of state, all members of the General Assembly. Uh, it was just amended to include federal elections. So that's president and uh, Congress and extended to primaries. So we think this would be a really fantastic bill. There's an analogous bill um, it's HB 2416 uh, in, in the House. Um, the House bill has not yet been amended, but it's, it's in there as well. Now we do think there's gonna be a little bit of time before this bill passes. And so we're also working at the, the city level. Um, we, will be, uh, we, we will be launching a campaign in Evanston. Evanston has strong support in their community already for ranked choice voting. They tend to be a community that's very open to reforms. There was just a reparations bill, for instance, that passed in Evanston. There, the mayor of Evanston, uh, Daniel Biss, introduced the ranked choice voting bill when he was an Illinois state senator. Um, so, so lots of reasons. There's also, we could go on and on. There's a lot of impact that Evanston has on Chicago and the surrounding areas. So it's a great place to get it going um, so that we could, we could expand it to the rest of the state. And in order for ranked choice voting to pass at a city level, it would require a referendum according to uh, state law. So that's either a citizen's initiative where we get signatures and put it on the ballot or city council. And in our case, city council seems to be very supportive of, supportive of ranked choice voting in Evanston. So we're hoping that they will put it on the ballot for June 28th of the, the primary that's happening next year in 2022. And at that point, the voters would go and they would get their say, do we want this? Yes, no. Um, and if any of this is an interest in Evanston, we I'll plug our, our Fair Vote Illinois. We have our monthly meeting, happens to be this coming up Wednesday at 7 p.m. And Evanston's gonna be a, the, the main topic. So again, you know, we wanna get this done uh, we think, we think um, it really does make just too much sense. Our main objective, even though I showed the progress being made in the Illinois Senate and the Illinois House and in Evanston, our main thing that we do is just talk about ranked choice voting. And we talk about it with voters and we do presentations and we go to farmers markets or wherever, wherever anyone is willing to listen. Because what we're finding is, is that the more and more we talk about it, um, people overwhelmingly are, are very receptive. Uh, the, the, main, the, the main obstacle to it is, is awareness. And once people realize how it works um, and they get comfortable because it's happening in other places too, uh, it's something that we could do here and, and get, get lots of the benefits. And then if, if people are, I'll plug our organization a little bit again, but if you are interested in getting more involved with uh, Fair Vote, the main thing you could do is just go to the website, sign up, and, and that helps us out just because you'll get on our mailing list and you'll get kept up to date 
and every so often we, we send out an email asking for help with an action. So once that Senate bill is becoming closer to reality, we might send out an email saying, now is the time to act, pick up the phone, call your, call your state rep or senator. Um, but there, there's lots on the website to help out, to attend an event, follow us on all of the social media. And, and really that's it, that, that's all I really wanted to cover. I left a lot of time on this presentation or after this presentation to answer more specific questions. I kept this kind of high level, but really ranked choice voting is fairly straightforward. It's, it's fairly simple. Um, and so I could go through the slides again about how votes are counted, but the main thing is it's an instant runoff election, which is another name for it. You know, if, if, if your first choice gets eliminated because no one has 50%, um, your vote goes to your next choice. So can you go through those charts again real quick, if you don't mind, just, just, just to show us how it works one more time? Sure thing. Yeah, so here's my ballot again. And I rank my choices. So the first column, I put my first choice. I chose Sylvester. Um, my second choice, I chose Bugs Bunny. The ch third choice, Wiley Coyote. Fourth choice, Daffy Duck. And fifth choice, I left blank because again, I I can't stand that Roadrunner. So I'm not I'm not voting for him. And then when the the votes are counted, we just look at everyone's first first place or first choice. So my vote is only going to count towards Sylvester. And when we add up those votes, we look at everyone's percentage of votes. If someone has a majority, 50% or more, the election's over. But in this case, in this example that I'm showing, no one does. Daffy Duck's in the lead with 38. Bugs Bunny's right on his tail. Um, and since no one has a majority, we eliminate the last place candidate. In this case, it's Wally Coyote. And if, if you voted for him for your first choice, your vote goes to your second choice. So we just reallocate those votes. And, and then we repeat that process. And Sylvester gets eliminated. Anyone who voted for Sylvester, um, whose vote was for Sylvester, their vote goes to their next choice. And then same thing with the Roadrunner. Now, now, another way of, of thinking about this is at the end, you know, when we get to this point, we get to determine which candidate wins in a head-to-head -head matchup. So if the top two candidates are Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck, we could have other candidates run. We'd have all these other candidates run and people could vote for whoever they like. And in the end, we're gonna find out if, if it comes down to between Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck, we're gonna find out who would win between, in a head-to-head -head matchup between the two. And we could be happy with, at least, at least in that case, we know who wins in the head-to-head -head matchup and that's who gets elected not someone who split more votes. My next question is why did you rig it so that Bugs Bunny would win and not the road and not Wiley <laughs> Coyote? Let's thank our speaker <laughs> before we go to question. I mean, he's the super genius. <laughs> and this looks like something he would be in favor of. <laughs> Yeah, well, Wild, Wild Lee Coyote was my uh, third choice in that in that example, so I don't know. Uh, I'm a fan of cats, so Sylvester gets my uh, gets my top choice. Yeah, I'm wondering how Beavis and Butthead would fare in that election. <laughs> anyway, let's go to general questions. How does this sounds like a good idea? And um, Justin, go ahead. If you want to start off with our questions, uh, you've got your hand raised. So uh, unmute and ask away. Uh, Andrew, thank you for the presentation. Uh, and, and thank you for all that uh, you guys do at Fair Vote. Um, just so you know, Fair Vote is going to be at the Libertarian Party State Convention. <laughs> um on october 8th and 9th uh so uh if you're interested in in seeing um fair vote uh at our state convention i think andrew will be there so but my question is 
Uh, and I, I did miss the first part of the a little bit like the first few minutes of the presentation. Maybe you covered it. Mm -hmm. um, but is is beyond uh, beyond ranked choice voting? Does fair vote do anything? Uh, does fair vote do any uh, initiatives as far as um, e like equal access? As far you know, parties getting the same. Uh, yeah, so it's all the ballot access. Uh, ballot access threshold. Yes, yeah, so, so um, formally, right, we're, we're advocating for ranked choice voting and and our, our sort of stance is we, we kind of take the general position is we support things in principle that, you know, make elections more fair and whatnot. And we're, we're working through what our language, and this is Fair Vote Illinois, so there's a national organization, Fair Vote. Um, Fair Vote National um, has language on their website. They're, they're advocates for ballot access. That's, that's more fair. Um, Illinois is horrendous. It's really bad. And, and we realize that. And so we're working through as an organization just how we want to um, express our support because we, we already talked about it. We're, we're all in favor of ballot access and supporting it. Um, we just we just want to know what like we're we're trying to work through what language do we put on our website for for instance how much are we advocating for that when we go out in Canvas right because we we do want to keep we do want to make sure our message stays <laughs> we like being a single issue organization it just makes it easier and simpler especially since we're we're all volunteers and there's turnover frequently um, you know we want to keep it simple but at the same time. Uh, we want to make sure we're we're doing what's right, and and ballot access is one of these things. And as you presumably know, in Illinois, it's really bad for for um, you know, non-established parties, if you want to use the term that they use. Um, so I'm not sure if I really answer that because because formally we didn't adopt anything just yet. However, we internally we had a board our last board meeting we discussed this topic in particular. And um, and we all, our votes were all, yes, we support ballot access laws and, and comments, what, what makes sense. Uh, we just didn't formalize our language yet. That's good. Uh, uh, thank you for that. I, I, uh, I, my, I regularly am in contact with my state rep over this issue and I'm very mm -hmm. annoying to him about it. Like, I will reply to my, you know, constituent emails that <laughs> off topic with like, Hey man, when can we get some equal ballot access? Um, and he says he supports it. He'll, he just doesn't, uh, I, I think that he thinks that if there's like a organization behind it, instead of like some disgruntled constituent calling him to annoy him about the issue, he may take it more seriously. So that's good that you guys are 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 trying to specifically address that. So good. To one know. thing, one thing that's also in the bill that got written up for ranked choice voting for statewide elections, um, and it's it's probably a subtle thing, but it's it's probably still important. Was that when for determining the voting threshold, if, if we switch to ranked choice voting, we would use first plate your first choice vote count, your first your first. Yeah, your first choice vote percentage. So um, if it's a 5% threshold, uh, with a ranked choice voting election, it should be, a, it's still kind of ridiculous, but, but it would be, it'd be a little bit easier to get because it might be easier to convince people who say, yeah, I like, you know, I like the Libertarian or the Green Party or whatever the party um, candidate. Um, so I'm going to put them number one, even if I know my votes, or even if I feel my vote will likely get transferred to the next choice, right? And because because they should be on the ballot, and I prefer them, right? And you vote however you prefer. So so it makes that threshold a little bit easier. It doesn't it doesn't solve it, but it's it's at least the right way to write up the ranked choice voting bill. You definitely don't want to do it after people are eliminated and say, okay, well you got zero percent. 
Okay, I think Richard is next because he had his hand raised. So go ahead, Richard. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot for the presentation, Andrew. Uh, a couple of quick, well, one quick question, first of all. I seem to recall this has been in, in use in Ireland for many years, and I believe they're, they're very satisfied with the results there. Is that correct? Yeah, Ireland has used ranked choice voting for 100 years. 100, okay. Yes, and so, so what, what's really great about, and same with Australia, they've used it for a century as well. And, and there's other countries that have used ranked choice voting. Those two are the most prominent. Doesn't um, that get complicated? I'm sorry, my apologies. Doesn't it get, get complicated with parliamentary elections though? Uh, part of the parliamentary is, it's funny because they, they have lots and tons of candidates and they, and you have um, multi-winner. Um, so it's, a, it's still ranked choice voting, but it's, um, it, it does get a little bit more, uh, not necessarily complex, but there's a lot of candidates running and, and a lot of work to do on that. Um, for, for Ireland, when, when it, for, well, for both, what's really promising about that is obviously doing this for a hundred years, they're able to hand count votes, right? So, so there's always, if there's, there's ever a concern about, you know, audits and things like that, in some ways it, it's, it's been done <laughs> before. Um, there's a paper trail, there's nothing really concerning as far as uh, audits go, um, which is, which is, Nice to see. But yes, it's been done and for a long time. The second question was regarding the recent uh, election in New York, which turned out to be something of a fiasco. Is that because the New York election board is fundamentally corrupt, <laughs> incredibly bad, really bad, or were there other reasons as well? Yeah, so there, there were two things that were went really poorly, I would say, in, in New York. Um, one was that it took a long time to get results. Right, and ranked choice voting took some of the blame for that, and it really wasn't all that fair for ranked choice voting to get the blame. That the real reason it took a while, and, and we kind of knew this going in, was that um, New York doesn't allow absentee or mail-in ballots to get to even begin being counted until a week or it was ten days. I'm not sure which one till after the election. So they would collect all the ballots, and then ten days later, then they would start counting. And so whether it was ranked choice or not, the election was not, the results were gonna be unknown. Um, so that's what really caused the delay. The other big issue was that test ballots were included in a preliminary results. Um, and that was just, I, I mean, again, that could happen with any type of election. It's, it's completely independent from ranked choice voting. They probably did more testing since they were trying out ranked choice voting, but that was just a big screw up by the board of election or the election board. Um, so <laughs> unfortunately ranked choice voting had, had some negative press because of that and it's not necessarily fair, but, um, but those were the real issues. I would say out of New York, the metrics that we were looking for before the election, because we were thinking what metrics would we have so we know whether or not ranked choice voting were. And we wanted to know how easy did, pe did people say it was to use? And we found that 95% said it was easy to use and that was consistent across all demographics. So that was, that was great. Um, another metric was again, polling data, but it was uh, exit polling. Do you prefer to use ranked choice voting going forward? Um, and that was 77%. So awesome, you know, 77%. And then we, there was another metric um, for, uh, or there were two other metrics we were looking for. Um, one was how many people fill out more than one candidate, um, and we wouldn't expect we wouldn't expect everyone to because some people just say, "Nope, I'm this is my guy, and if it's not him, I don't care." Right. So it was 85 percent that filled out more than one candidate, which was right in the ballpark of what we were hoping for. So that was great. And then the only other one was improperly marked ballots. So uh, just to see if it's still consistent with all the other elections. And I, I don't have results for that, but um, presumably it was about the same because otherwise we may, we may have heard about it. Great. Hey, Andrew. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Anybody who's ever worked a polling place outside of one knows that uh, Voters very often have no idea 
who's running for an election. And according to your plan, people will be not only voting for one half, how are they supposed to know about half a dozen candidates? Yeah, and, and that's, a, that's a, a really- They're just guessing. Yeah, yeah, they're guessing in some cases, but but let me let me clarify it a little well, that's bit. That's what you want, voting by guess. guess. <laughs> well, that's well, a good idea, right? Well, so so presumably you still were already guessing in a sense, right? You, but but you're still putting your first choice first, second choice, right? So so even if you only know a few who you like, you could vote one, two, three, and then after that, okay, okay, who knows what you do. Um, there is a form of ranked choice voting that Alaska adopted. Um, and, you know, it, again, this is getting into the weeds a little bit, but, but they use open primaries or they will be using open primaries. So it's an open nonpartisan primary, the same way like we do for mayor of Chicago. And you vote the same way we do for mayor, you just pick one candidate. Um, and then the top five vote getters go on to the general. And then, and then there's five candidates and you rank five. So then you're asking voters, you know, to, to try to look into five candidates, but it, it, it somewhat solves some of that problem, the open primaries combined with ranked choice voting. It also um, tends to drive consensus a little bit. So it might, it might bring us more towards the middle. I don't know. I'm, I mean, that's sort of somewhat the thought if we use the open primaries in top five. Um, but, but it, it helps with that, that problem of choice. But one thing we don't want, or <laughs> we want ballot access. So we want people to be on the ballot, but we, you know, there's 40 candidates that that's a little bit messy too. Um, and, and so something like the top five with open primaries would make a lot of sense in those cases. It depends on the election a little bit. Charlie, we're already having voting by guessing for all the judges. Nobody has a clue who they are. And that is it. The IVI issues a voting guide on that, and so do other organizations. Yeah. Information's there if you choose to look for it, but it's hard to find, or people don't, don't find it very often or by name. You're entirely correct. I hate to be so correct. Yeah. In some ways, it's not, not entirely a ranked choice voting issue. It's, yeah, <laughs> as Richard said. Voting by guessing, I was thinking. Yeah. About. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I know. Right? So, so even even today, like you said, it, it's there's a little bit of vote by guessing going on. But Andrew, does your organization advocate that I contact my state representatives as an annoying, disgruntled person? <laughs> Sometimes we do. Um, <laughs> Sometimes they do advocate that we we contact our, our state reps. Um, at the moment, we're not we're not. Um, reaching out. We, the main thing we wanted to do with, with contacting our state reps at this point was just to also put it on their radar. And it wasn't necessarily to get it passed just yet, because we know, you know, but we, we, want, we want our state reps to be aware. And, and unfortunately, even some of the state reps, um, state senators, um, haven't heard about ranked choice voting before. So by, by putting it, just by getting some calls and they see it in their notes, uh, they, they have to look into the issue a little bit. And that's what we want. We just want them to know what it is, how it works, and they can make their decision. Um, okay, who's got the next question? We got plenty of time here, so please go try, go right in and dive in. Guillermo, you got your hand up, go ahead. Yeah, Andrew, I have several uh, items. Okay. Chicago is a very diverse city. And suburban Cook County and Chicago Board of Elections, they have 10 different languages in their websites. We have in Chicago uh, outreach community workers for uh, Polish, Chinese, Latino, Asian American, Filipino, you name it. I've been there a thousand times in the Latino communities. And uh, we third grade education, broken English. It's not easy right now. I have to register them, uh, recruit them to become judges of election by uh, US court orders, and also to vote and explain the voting process. 
to explain ranked choice voting could be a little bit difficult um, for them to understand. In addition to that, what ranked choice voting is for vote by mail, military and overseas voters, nursing homes, detainees, handicapped people, I still don't see how ranked choice voting can handle different groups of voters at different times. Uh, you may have to explain that to them or pass it through law. Okay. Uh, I, I have, it's bothering me in my mind. Okay. You, okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'll start with the, the different languages, right? So, so we haven't, we haven't started translating our materials to, to any other language yet. So we're right I, now. I do all the translations of the Board of Elections for years and the website pages and everything. We, we have people to do that too. Yeah. Yeah. So, so New York City just went through this process and they, um, uh, they, they had to do this where they, they did translate all the materials to, yes, Polish, Chinese, <laughs> um, uh, Spanish, German, every language under the sun um, because the voters, oh, you know. Not easy. Yeah, it, so, so, so that's part of, that's part of um, the uh, voter education that has to happen with, with ranked choice voting. Um, in, in New York, they still saw very high turnouts. And, and again, across the demographic groups, uh, it was 95 percentile. It was, I mean, 94 percent to 96 percent across all demographics. Um, I was saying that was easy to use. And so one of the things that they focused on in New York was saying, you don't need to worry about how votes are counted, right? You could look at it, you could explain it from the voter's perspective, which is just rank, rank your choices. What's your favorite? First choice, second choice, third choice, down the list. Um, we've, done, we've done some um, experiments with little kids, right? And they you, know, they know how to rank choices when you just tell them rank them your favorite, second. Uh, there, there was a ranked choice voting done in a middle school uh, with virtually no training and, uh, you know, same thing. This was done by the Ranked Choice Voting Resource Center. So, so it's by focusing, we, we don't focus as, as much for voter education on how the votes are counted, like how, you know, if, you're, if your vote candidate gets eliminated, you know, your vote goes to your next choice. Um, but we do make sure they understand that they, can, they don't need to worry about um, about being strategic, just vote who's your favorite, second choice, third choice down the list. And, and voters see, seem to, to understand that. Um, as far as like absentee, and if I didn't answer that, we'll go we'll back to it. But as far as the um, absentee ballots and overseas, we found this to be a really big success, especially in um, presidential primaries. So one of the things that happened in uh, the presidential primaries in 2020, there were five states that used it for the Democratic presidential primaries, uh, Alaska, Hawaii, Nevada, Wyoming, and Kansas. And especially with mail-in voting, what was really nice was that when candidates dropped out of the, of the race, your, your vote automatically got transferred to your next choice, right? So if I voted for whatever, Andrew Yang, number one, because I think he dropped out kind of early, and Bernie Sanders, number two, and Biden, third, or whatever. You know, my, my, by the time it came to my vote and Andrew Yang's no longer there, my, my vote automatically went to my next choice, which is Bernie Sanders in that example. Um, uh, overseas and military, I think that's, that's the reason they use it in the South. It's not, so they use it in... Um, Louisiana and South Carolina, um, a few other states in the South. And it's, they use it for that reason. So that even if other people are not using ranked choice voting, um, they, they let their military people use it. And then it's really used just to say, candidates that drop out no longer count because they're often voting earlier than everyone else. And so sometimes candidates drop out of the election before their votes make it in. And so they, they switched to this method of, of ranked choice voting so that their vote goes to their first candidate that's not eliminated or hasn't dropped out of the election. Um, so I, I, I'm not sure if that answered that, that question. Yeah, well, uh, they take these and nursing homes. Oh, 
Um, I, yeah, I, I don't really know other than we would have to do some kind of voter education there as well. Oh, right. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> okay, hang on. Any more questions, real quick? We got a long way more to do, so keep asking. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Guillermo, I'm not really, really positive for, for nursing homes other than the same thing. We would have to do some kind of, of uh, voter education the same way we would with any group. Um, but that'd be part of it. Uh, it's going to be very hard and difficult in Chicago. Evanston is easy, yeah, compared to Chicago. Yeah. Well, it is promising to see see what new that New York is a big city that that went through it, right? So we could we could learn a little. I could I could look into it a little bit more because we're we're not that far. I mean, we're pretty far along with our campaign and thinking ahead about how we would actually implement ranked choice voting, um, what the ballots would look like, um, what the software for voting equipment has to be. All all that stuff we looked into a lot of it. Um, the education campaign we started on, but we haven't. We haven't, we haven't gotten into the details about how we would make it to all, all the necessary groups. And that would be somewhat on the state to do, but you know, as, as Fair Vote Illinois, we want this to, we don't want to just make it happen just so that we say we rank choice voting happen. We want it to, to improve elections. So we want it to work. We want the rollout to be smooth. But no, those are, that's a great point. Andrew, mm -hmm. the established political parties perform a very important function in that they filter the candidates. They interview and examine the candidates and then only then approve them for, to achieve ballot status. Your process mm -hmm. does not incorporate that. Now, having served on a on a candidate selection committee for the Green Party, I can assure you that people will apply to be candidates and want to run for office who have clear disqualifying attributes or views. So your system would allow, I think, allow me to vote for a communist, wouldn't it? Um. So it's the same rules now for, for okay, so, so it depends on what flavor of, of ranked choice voting a little bit, but let's say, let's say what we're advocating for in Illinois. Um, in Illinois, there would be ranked choice voting used in the party's primary. So if you're, you know, Green Party or Republican Party or whatever, you would use ranked choice voting to select your candidate. And then once you have your candidates in the general, you use ranked choice voting. So it'd be one Democrat, one Republican, one Green Party, one Libertarian. And if someone wants to run under the whatever, some party that's a uh, far left or far right, um, I guess they could run. I, I, like, I don't know if they, if they do everything that's required. They, in Illinois, it would require them to collect enough signatures um, to get put on the ballot. If that was the case, I, I suppose they could run. Um, but you're still, we still could see that if they're running as a party that wasn't didn't exist before. Um, so in some ways, it's not much different than we have now. With, if, if we went more with the Alaska version, where there's an open primary, um, there's still rules for how you get on the primary ballot. Um, but you could have three Republicans running and four Democrats and two Libertarians in the, in the open primary. Um, and so in that case, in that case, it still, it still could be the uh, um, somewhat the party's rules for how they want to decide who gets to, to go on their ballot and run in their primary. Um, but not every party has to have the same rules. So, I've got a question, Andrew. Mm -hmm. Are there any candidates running in Illinois right now that have ranked choice as part of their campaign platform? Um, yeah, so 
<laughs> so we talked to one. Um, um, okay, so there, there's there are people who are in office who, who support it, right? So there's eight co-sponsors of the bill in the Illinois Senate, um, and then there's one one uh, representative who formally endorses it. Or he introduced the bill, ranked choice voting bill. Um, as far as candidates running, um, we talked to one candidate who, who supports ranked choice voting, um, Chris Roper. He's a uh, um, running for governor, um, probably not one of the top, I'm guessing candidates, but, but he does support it. Um, we haven't reached out to many of the candidates, so they may be supporting it. We don't really know. Um, we were, we what are were some positions. Yeah. What are some positions that somebody could run for where they would be effective at bringing about that change, like uh, Secretary of State or a local yeah. county clerk or county yes. board? Would they all. I, I mean, <laughs> yeah. Well, well, we really think any any municipalities where there's support from enough of the city council, we, we could we could go to that city. So a lot of cities in Illinois have home rule. If you have a population typically of 25,000 or more, um, home rule applies, which means that you can change your, you can switch over to ranked choice voting. It would require a referendum. So that's what we're trying to do in Evanston, just because there's so many supporters. Like I said, Daniel Biss is the mayor and he supports it. That, that's tremendously helpful. Um, but then their city council, there's at least, it's a nine member city council. And it looks like they have a lot of support from in the city council. Um, so, so we, we think what we think makes the most sense is for any cities where where there is support of enough support within the community and enough support on the city council that would be easy enough. Um, yeah, we target those cities, and then once that happens, uh, statewide, uh, we we feel there will be enough momentum to get it through. And so, so we, we, we are talking to our state reps and state senators uh, kind of in an ad hoc fashion. So just as, you know, as we ping people on our social media or whatever that are part of an organization or part of a, a, a part of the office for one of the state reps um, and they, they show any kind of interest, we'll, we'll set up meetings and we'll talk to them. At this point, we're not really asking for endorsements. We're just letting them know that we're a resource to give them more information about ranked choice voting. And then um, hopefully we're just starting a conversation so that as it advances, uh, we could go out to them and, and get them to sign on. If we, if we had more volunteers and, and infinite resources, we would be calling every rep and state senator, but <laughs> we're volunteers. So it's, it's hard to do it all at, at the same time. We're doing it as much in parallel as we can. We still have a lot of openings and a lot of questions. Uh, who else uh, has anything they want to they want to say? Um, Andrew, how do you think? Do you think? I know it's starting to get down to some popularity here in the states with some of these stuff. Um, can you give us some of your struggles from some of your other colleagues and how they got it on the ballot in that particular state? Um, yeah, so, so you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very involved with, with uh, I shouldn't say very involved. I, I meet regularly with Fair Vote National um, and it's, we have a call twice a month and it's not really with Fair Vote National as much as all the other state groups come and they say, this is, these are our struggles, what we're doing, what we're seeing. Um, there's a little bit, some states have different struggles than, than we have it here in Illinois, some whatever. Um, largely, largely it's, it's how, do you, how do you mobilize volunteers <laughs> and, and try to get people out there and talking because if we, most, most of the time we, we get more supporters when we have more involved conversations, right? We, we get to hang flyers and things. And um, what we find, I think what I said before, when we talk to people, overwhelmingly people support it, but really people fall into two buckets. Either they're, they're all in, they love it, or, or they don't, 
they don't, they're not opposed. That's not the other bucket. The other bucket is they don't really care or they, they don't see how it impacts them. And so when we have more like conversations about it, uh, about what they care about and how, how we fix, um, how we fix the way government works in a sense, uh, their issue could also get addressed. Uh, those type of things help bring people in. I, that really didn't answer what you were, I don't think what you were originally asking, but that's, that's what a lot of the state groups are, are working on and just how to mobilize kind of from the ground up. Um, there are challenges in different states legally. Um, so, so in Illinois, for instance, I already mentioned that we need at the city level, we need a referendum. Um, in some, some states, you don't need that. Some states, city council could just approve it and it's no choice voting is the law of the land. And that's, that's easier in a sense, because then you have, like Evanston, we'd have, we'd have to convince five of nine people plus the mayor and, and they could switch it. I, I mean, they might not if, if the people of Evanston didn't want it, but, um, but those are the, those are the, the main thing is, is you still getting the word out. And then I guess one other thing is sometimes, um, we're really careful about staying nonpartisan because it's a completely nonpartisan issue. Some state groups are having a harder time bringing in, um, you know, people from from all sides of the aisle. So, so some states have are very left leaning in their organizational makeup, um, whereas others have some from, you know, left and right. But but it's it's concerning because then they're like, well, is this a partisan issue? We don't want to make it that way, or we don't want it to be perceived that way. Okay, Andrew. Mm -hmm. We currently have a a primary a process of a primary, and then a general election. In essence, don't we already have ranked choice voting? Um. So wait, wait, because we have a primary and then a general? Yeah, we have a process of filtering candidates out. Well, well so, so we have, a, it's a process, but so we're not necessarily any different. So, so, so the, the issue is in a primary or, or in a general, let's say it's in a general. Um, in a general, it, it's pretty frequent that the candidate who wins the election has less than 50%. Happens more frequently than it, way more frequently than it should. And, and oftentimes they would still be the most preferred, but we don't really know that. Um, so when, yes, the way we do it today, we're filtering out people in a primary first um, and then in a general second. Um, I, would say, I would say, arguably that's what's leading to some of this polarization though. So the people who come out to a primary tend to be the people who are um, more on the edges you want to call it that, <laughs> right? So your, your Republican goes a little bit farther to the right, your Democrat goes farther to the left because only a very small subset of people are going to their primary and they're selecting the candidate and those people tend to be the one who are more extreme. And then when you get to the general, we're choosing between two that are kind of drifting further and further apart. Um, so with ranked choice um, in the primary, you're more likely to get someone who's in the middle of the party just because people would rank their choices. You'd have some on the, you know, edges, <laughs> more moderate edge of the, of the party, some of the more extreme, and you'd probably get more into the middle of the party just through the primary. And then the general, probably the same. It seems to me that in one process, the filtering is at the beginning and in your process, the filtering is at the end. But, well, so, so in Illinois, the way we have, would implement it, it would be the same process. We'd still do primaries and you do ranked choice voting in the primaries. Okay. And then you'd have the general and you do ranked All choice right. voting in the general. I didn't know that. Yeah, so, so that's, how, that's how the bill is um, as it is today. Now there is the option of uh, Chicago has an open, in a sense, an open nonpartisan primary for the mayor, right? It's everybody, it's nonpartisan. <laughs> technically at least, um, and then the top two go to a general or to a runoff. Um, so in that case, we might, we might say, okay, there's no need for that second election. We could just do one. But, or, or we could do what, what, you know, and 
what what Alaska does, where you yeah. choose the top five, and then the general is ranked choice within a limited scope. You know, sometimes Andrew, you say negative campaigning goes out of style with ranked choice voting in a lot of cases. <laughs> it doesn't go all the way away. I'm not claiming that. It just it just reduces it a bit. Because I'll tell you, some of those uh, negative ads I like are pretty damn creative. <laughs> You know, like the Lincoln Project and Trump, you know, some of that stuff. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. there have been there have been some uh I like the Willie Horton ad from a lot years ago and you know, some of that stuff can really get to be uh quite an eye opener as to how what links certain candidates will go to. Do you think that that will ever go away or do you think it'll probably be part of uh your ranked choice voting system? Yeah, I mean there was there was there were still negative campaigning in, in New York when they used ranked choice voting. It's not like it went away entirely. Um, so, so I in, in other places that use ranked choice voting, there's still some negative campaigning. Um, some of sometimes negative campaigning is valid too, right? Like you say, wait a second, Mike. You know, this guy's running for office and he did X, Y, Z, whatever. Are you sure that's who you want? <laughs> right? And so, but but it it it. It, incent it does create the incentive to not be so negative, right? It doesn't, it doesn't serve the person best if you're... Um, I mean, why couldn't we adopt like the British style of insults to have in a house of commons? I mean, that's some of the more creative insults we've ever had. All right. Yeah, that'd be fun. <laughs> <laughs> this is ridiculous. I'd say my, my, my uh, esteemed honorable colleague the Honorable Mr. Paydock's a little dissatisfied with the way the questioning is Yeah, going. I've got a legitimate question. How would, <laughs> how would ranked choice voting arrange the debates? You mean you'd allow everyone at the podium? You're, you're yes. muted, Andrew. Oh. <laughs> it, it, it'd be the same as however you're determining it today, right? So I, so. I mean, seriously. I, I watch a lot of the state and local debates mm -hmm. and in Alaska in particular, and wow. they're totally unqualified people at the podium and there are one or two legitimate candidates and these fringe candidates don't really contribute anything. They're just kind of noise or interference. I'm serious. They're are legitimate candidates for office and then you've got strange people on you've got to listen to and i don't think that benefits what's the question <laughs> i didn't you hear it no Did you're you just going on and working? talking about is your computer not working justin is everybody loud at the debates charlie Ranked choice voting has nothing to do with debates. So you're asking him a question that's like nothing to do with the topic at hand. It's you're just you bloviating so you can hear yourself talk. Oh no, no, you chair the meeting, huh? Hey, who elected you to chair the meeting? <laughs> he's just ranked he's choice, just, ranked Charlie, choice chair. Uh yeah, so, so I would say, like, in a general election, there's... Right. Somebody who's a Stalinist uh, should really uh, pull the plank out of his own eye before he calls people grin. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Justin, let Charlie finish his question. We'll uh, then go to you, okay? I just want to know yeah. if the debates are the same. And so, so everybody shows up. I've not seen that to be positive, to have people who are just there... And they're not really running for office, uh, filling in a spot, perhaps. In Alaska, in particular, uh, I've watched the debate, and you have one or two r real candidates discussing real issues, and then other people, like College of Complex people. <laughs> That's all. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so, so I guess I'll just comment on that really quick, which is, yeah. There, there's no real change to who gets on the ballot with ranked choice voting as opposed to who gets on the ballot today, right? So if, if it's the debate stage, it's going to get populated. If, if someone qualifies to be 
listed on the ballot, um, they may qualify to be on the debate stage, depending on the rules of, of what qualifies a candidate to be on the debate stage. So, so I, don't, I don't really think that changes with ranked choice voting. It just means when you go to vote, you get to select your preferences in, in order that you like them. All right, Justin, you got your hand up, so go ahead and ask your ask away. Yeah, uh, has there been, I, I can't think of any right now, uh, but has there been any sort of uh, unintended consequences that have happened in places where there is ranked choice voting or theoretical un unintended consequences that, that have been brought up with regards to this? Um, so, so I guess as far as, as unintended consequences, the main, the main thing that we're saying is really, um, <laughs> I would say a little bit of misinformation, right? Where, where people blame ranked choice voting for losing <laughs> when, when they, so, um, there was a case, um, in Alaska, a house race, and I, I can't think of the exact race, but where the Republican candidate during the first first round was a little bit ahead of the Democrat, but they're a very independent heavy state. And so when the, when the independent was eliminated, the, the Democrat won. And, and there was a little bit of, of blaming right choice voting for the loss. Um, you know, there, there's something like that, but I, you know, I think, I think that's exactly what ranked choice voting is intended to do, at least in that case, in a head-to-head -head matchup, the Democrat was re referred to the Republican. So that's who, it, and that's what ranked choice voting is supposed to solve, but it was twisted around a little bit. Um, hypothetically, um, you know, I, I, got, I got asked by Chicago Magazine some questions and I didn't know what they were really writing up, but they, they kind of went into a hypothetical about Harold Washington and said, you know, had we had ranked choice voting, um, Harold Washington would have never got elected. And um, that was kind of their reasoning for um, saying ranked choice voting is a bad idea. Um, I, again, I don't, <laughs> I don't think that's a very valid example. Um, there, there could be times where the most preferred candidate doesn't get elected and they turn out to be great. And, uh, or, or that the most preferred candidate does get elected and they turn out to be terrible. But in general, you want, you want the person getting elected who's the most preferred. And so I can't really think of anything other than, other than those. Okay, um, who else has got a question now? We still got some time let yet. Um, I know we've been going a little bit more, starting to lose people in here. Um, who else has a question? Anybody else? If not, we can move to rebuttals if you'd like. Uh, Charlie, what do you think? Well, if there's no more questions, let's thank our speaker and go for comments. All right, thank you. Well, thank you, hey. Andrew. All right, we- uh, Thanks, Andrew. Okay, so I know uh, I'll go. Uh, how many want to rebut rebut tonight? I'm not uh, um, in the going to be giving one. I know Charlie has one. I know probably Ken and Justin might have one. Michael Casangi. And so uh, since we got some time, I'll let you guys go seven, eight, ten minutes, depending on what you want to do. Uh, who would like to go first? All right, come on. We got an open. Call. I don't have much to say. I definitely don't have 10 minutes. I put my response to uh, what Charlie said there in the comments. Uh, it's not up to the system to decide who's qualified and who isn't. Ultimately, it's up to the voter. And so I don't mind a lot of people being on the ballot, uh, whether you say they're qualified or not. You don't need to cast your third or fourth or fifth or even second yeah. vote for somebody you don't like. If you don't want to cast more than one vote, you don't have to. Okay. Uh... Who else has a, a rebuttal tonight? Vicki, Jim, Justin, you got something to say? I hope uh, he's not. He's not there. Well, Charlie, how about you? You want to rebut? 
Okay, I'm not quite ready, but I'd like to thank our speaker uh, for a very nice presentation. Uh, that was probably one of the best PowerPoints I've ever seen. It's got some high tech features, which I can appreciate. And I, on behalf of the voting population, uh, we certainly appreciate your efforts. Um, I was going to ask a question. I, is there any way that ranked choice voting can be manipulated to result in voter suppression? I don't think so, but that seems to be the current issue and concern out there. My, I'm kind of open to change and progress, but I'm also somewhat traditional when it comes to structuring an election. Um, I don't know if you have to rank the plus and benefits of each process before you change it. And you also have what is known as unforeseen conditions when you make a change. Rank choice voting certainly isn't new. It was used in Illinois when we had an enormous number of state representatives and made some degree of sense. My primary concern is, is that there are some controls exercised by the established political parties in terms of presenting candidates for office. In fact, there's a review process that they at least have some qualifications to serve in the office. I'm not certain if that's the case with ranked choice voting. And as a long-term member of a third party, I, all of my colleagues are advocates of ranked choice voting. So I stand a little bit apart from them. I certainly know the difficulties of ballot access. Uh, the inherent, the one real concern I have, the aim of this should be good government. And I didn't see that in the, in the um, presentation necessarily. Will this in fact result in good government? Are good people being precluded from serving in office? Or are we opening the door, which I fear, to letting unqualified strange people given the control of the government? Now, the government, federal government has very stringent rules and regulations in order to be a, in civil service. It takes a minimum of three years, and it's an extensive review process in order to become a federal employee. But this now is another one where we're getting employees of the government, and there's no review process or minimal I can perceive. I'm very much concerned that most people do not know, in fact, who they are voting for. Um, and it's likely to open the likelihood up to mere selection on the basis of chance. I saw the figure there that women are more likely to get elected through ranked choice voting which this may or may not be a valid conclusion, but it could be the result of women simply voting for someone who is a woman, which they're entitled to do if they represent issues of concern to women. But that is my major concern is what check is there upon the system to preclude uh, people? We're, this is really important. Who is in charge of our government? And that can have long-term, very negative effects. They can do an awful lot of damage in a very short period of time. Now, it sounds real nice, and I'm a lefty, to open it up to everyone. Everyone is welcome. It's like in unions, we say everyone is welcome in the House of Labor. 
uh, but I'm not certain if that's necessarily the case. I mean, you have to think about this as a recruitment process in applying for a job and how you want to change this. Um, I'm not saying the current process of selecting people for employment is perfect, but I don't know if alternatives are even a better or an improvement. Anyhow, I, I think it's, it's probably opened it up and there's basic fairness in the system. I don't think there's anything too much to be alarmed about that could go wrong with ranked choice voting. And uh, no, I'm looking forward to it. I think it may generate some interest in, in voting in that regard. And that overall, it, the fact that if it gets more people out to the voting and more people to look at who is in fact running for office, then this is a positive thing. I mean, if you get more candidates out there uh, jostling about during the campaign, it's likely to generate some interest. And we certainly want to attract as many people as we can to want to serve in government, such as I did for several decades. Anyhow, thank you very much. Uh, come again and give us a report and update on what's going on. Okay, um, who else uh, has any comments to say? Um, if not, I'm gonna end the meeting a little early, but uh, all right, we'll just call the College of Complexes and adjourn it at this point. The speaker, Andrew's entitled to final I'm comment. I'm sorry about that. Uh, go ahead, Andrew. Okay, I wasn't aware that I, I had final comments. So you do, um, yeah. That, that's but, <laughs> oh no, no. Um, so it's not like I had uh, remarks prepared, but but we I really do see um, ranked choice voting as one of these things that is um, just makes a lot of sense. It, it you know it's it's been used all over the place enough to enough to give us confidence that it's it's working well in the places that use it um, and it changes the dynamics of our politics, which is really what I think is needed at this point to improve government and the way we, the way we interact with each other as a whole. So, um, no, I, I'm very excited that I was uh, able to speak here tonight and, and thanks for all the comments and questions. Um, it's great to get you know, uh, into the weeds a little bit about, about ranked choice voting. Um, I guess I'll end on a final plug for Fair Vote Illinois. So there's, if there is any interest, just go to our website, fairvoteillinois.org. And um, there's information about ranked choice voting, lots of commonly asked questions and things like that. Um, ways to get involved, attending events, making donations, which is always great, or um, volunteering, all great stuff. So When's thanks again. When is the next meeting? When is the next meeting? Oh, the next Fair Vote Illinois, we have we have a monthly meeting. We have lots of events on our calendar on our website, but our monthly meeting is on Wednesday at 7 p.m. And it's going to focus on Evanston. So what we're doing in Evanston. And um, it's still it's still somewhat of a soft launch of the campaign there. So we're still um, we're, we're doing public outreach, but general as we were doing even before uh, our campaign. Um, but you know, it's it's to pull people in for, for that effort. Okay. Anything else, real quick, Andrew? No, just thanks again. All right, then. I guess we'll uh, end the formal meeting of the college. I'll stop the recording. Yeah. And keep the call open for a while. Uh, whoever's got in there. So, again, my apologies for ending a little early tonight, but. Uh, We've got a lot in there, so uh, okay. this will constitute yeah. the end of the College of Complexes.